Once upon a time, I was a pretty difficult person to work with. Some might say very difficult person to work with. Some still might say I'm a difficult person to work with, but they're my family, so we're not gonna have to worry about them or listen to them at all. Why was I so difficult? Well, I, I was defensive. I, uh, I didn't listen to people. I tended to worry about what I was going to say next, right, rather than listen to somebody else. Um, I thought all my ideas were better than everybody else's, but I also lacked confidence. It was a terrible combination. So how did I solve this to the extent that I have? Well, it's very simple. I took an improv class. Now, people here take an improv class and they get a little frightened. Improv can be a very scary uh, craft and art form. It was incredibly scary for me. I, and I have a performing background. People often think that actors uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be afraid of taking an improv class at all, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Some of my closest friends that are performers are terrified of doing improvisation. In the same way that if you're a classically trained pianist and suddenly you're asked to make it all up, you might find that to be incredibly difficult. I took to it very well, but I was surprised by that. As in my studies as a performer, I wasn't funny. I had no access to my humor at all. It all had to do with all that, the confidence and the difficulty being honest. And improvisation absolutely unlocked my sense of humor, uh, a lot more of my confidence. And it can do that for everyone, especially non-performers. That's called applied improvisation. So improv is the art of people performing without a script, making it up as they go. It's usually a performer, a performer, and an audience. The audience is a very key component to that. But applied improvisation is using the skills and techniques and philosophy of improvisation for non-performers in order to do a non-performing goal. So a lot of corporations use um, a lot of our improv games as um, meeting warm-ups or uh, confidence building exercises or team building collaborative exercises. And that, that is all wonderful work. Uh, it's being done at very high levels. Uh, for example, at Stony Brook University, there is the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science, which is an incredibly exciting uh, place where they're, uh, they're creating certificate programs to give to scientists to help them improve their ability to communicate their ideas. Because if you can, because we struggle right now, we're looking at the world right now and communicating simple ideas like wearing a mask is very difficult. So that's what the Alan Alda Center is doing. But other companies uh, like Second City out of Chicago, uh, they have a whole corporate training program. Or Merlin Works in Austin, Texas, works a lot with doctors. So uh, applied improv is a growing field. At NJIT, we've created the Center for Applied Improvisation, where we host workshops that give our students um, uh, expertise in listening and, and learning how to collaborate with each other. More important than that though, from my perspective, the value of this work is the way it can change your mind by giving you an amplified experience. So I will talk about the two areas that I think we contribute the most to at a STEM university. So companies like Google are, have a completely different idea now of the kind of workers they want. Uh, they don't necessarily want just STEM thinkers, science, technology, engineering, and math. They don't necessarily want that. They can teach that stuff, some of it. What they want, though, are, are, are workers and managers with... Uh, different skills, like leadership skills. But what does leadership in the 21st century mean? Leadership in the 21st century is different than my, uh, my generation or even my father's generation, where you would get power and you would hang on for dear life. Leadership now means adaptive leadership, meaning I will take control of this project, but actually on the next one, that's a skill set that my partner might do better at. And so I will give power to that partner in order to make the project work. That is a rudimentary idea that you get in any improv class. You, uh, uh, one of the major principles of improv performance is uh, your partner is the most important person on stage and everything they say you agree to and you add something to, towards. 
Can you imagine if you were collaborating that way? So this is why these skills are often taught because taught in corporate environments because it creates um, a kind of beautiful uh, collaborative environment. But the, the leadership skills, the, that kind of thinking, that kind of generous thinking, another skill hu uh, improv gives is humility. We, we talk about embracing failure. It doesn't mean that we're celebrating failure or we're looking for failure. It means that we're willing to take the risks that inevitably lead to failure. And when we do, we build up the resilience to deal with it so that we get up and go out again next week. The people that are the most resilient to failure of any um, business I know of are probably stand-up comedians because they go out there and they fail all the time and then eventually they stop failing. Well, improv teaches that same idea. So when you get into, um, uh, when you're working on a project, we're more willing to take us a, a risk. And, and if it fails, we'll own it. That's another skill that they want you to have out there. They want you to own your successes and own your failures with humility. If you're successful, notice the people around you. Notice how they contributed to it. If you fail, own it. Have the confidence to say it didn't work. That confidence is what allowed me access to my humor. Once I discovered that if I acknowledged my failures, that I acknowledged that a moment didn't work, all of a sudden I got people to laugh. And once you get people to laugh, it's pretty extraordinary. The next thing I wanna talk about is the future and the kind of world that my students will inherit and my children will inherit. Um, a wonderful historian named Yuval Noah Harari has written three books, Sapiens, Homo Deus, and 20, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. In the final book, and in interviews supporting it, he has said several times that young people will be growing up in a world where they have to imagine, they will have to radically transform themselves every 10 years. Now, he said that a couple of years ago. He said that a couple of years ago, that in the future, people are going to have to imagine uh, a world in which they're going to have to completely reinvent themselves. Well, look around. Look at how I'm giving this talk. I'm supposed to be live on stage somewhere. That's where I would thrive. I find this to be quite a struggle, but I'm adapting to it as best I can. Harari says the world will flip every 10 years and we have to be prepared and look at what we've been dealing with for the last six months. Teachers in my profession are suddenly having to figure out Zoom and WebEx. Every profession has had to adapt entirely. The people that adapt will do okay. There's a lot of people though that will struggle with this. Improv and an improvisational philosophy and mindset can help. It won't solve it, certainly not, but it can help. Another thing Harari says that our young people will have to deal with is the fact that AI uh, and, and complex algorithms will know them better than they know themselves, will understand them on some level better than they understand, understand their own wants and desires better than they do. And we see it already. We see it, you know, when you're shopping for a bike online and then 10 minutes later, a bike shows up in your web. And, and we need to be aware of that. So mindfulness is something he says we need to cultivate. And I agree, mindfulness is very important, but there's another kind of mindfulness that we're, we're, we need to develop, and that is the mindfulness with each other. Learning how to read each other's behavior. Learning how to understand what people we don't agree with are thinking about and the way they're thinking. So my classroom is more of a laboratory for human empathy than a fun little class where people get to perform. We do have a fun little class where people get to perform, but there's another part of it, and it's the part that sneaks up on the students. It's the part where they learn to talk to each other. It's the part where we go, oh, what you said in that scene, that's actually kind of problematic. Let's go back and say it a different way. And then they've, they get a chance to rehearse these human encounters we have all the time where we're accidentally bumping into each other and making mistakes. The students in my room get to rehearse those a little bit and experiments a little bit. And maybe the next time they get near an encounter like that, they'll use the proper pronoun or they'll say something a little in a more sensitive way. We're treat, we, we end up treating the classroom like it's this experimental laboratory and it's kind of beautiful. I am not saying that improv is the philosophy that will solve all of our problems at all, of course not. 
Uh, but I do think it's a place where humans get to practice being humans. And there aren't a lot of opportunities to do that. Social media is not that. And even if you have to take an improv class online, learning how to communicate through this medium, learning how to reach out through the screen into somebody else, that is also hard and that is also a skill that we're going to need to cultivate because we are probably not going back to the same life we had. We have to adapt. And how do we adapt? Simple. Take an improv class.